This video is brought to you by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. Welcome back, everybody. It is time for another edition of Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast, also heard over the radio in Las Vegas on 101.5 K-Don and the Bet in Las Vegas, which is on the HD2 side. So welcome to our listeners there, and welcome to all of you. I am Scott Branson, joined by my co-host, he is one Mr. Mo Moten. We call him Midtown Mo. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. He is also a columnist talking about the Raiders, of course, on sportsnot.com. You can follow him on X at M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. That's Mo Moten. So he's got the E and the M after the M-O. Some guys go by Mo, but it's only M-O. He is M-O-E. All right. I am at LV Gully. You can follow and interact with us on X.com. We are very active there. I love to have fun with you guys. And also, you can catch my work at SportsNot, too. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, guess what? We're going to ask you to do that right now. Wherever you get your audio, look for Silver and Black today. Subscribe. Put on that auto download so you get the newest show possible for your morning commute or whenever you listen to us. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, Rumble, Twitch, wherever you're watching us, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Also, the notifications bell on YouTube. That way, you know when we have a new video up. Mo, uh, we inch closer, man. You and I were talking right before we went on the air about starting to feel like football season. And listen, no one is more amped up and ready to go than Raider Nation. They want, they're excited about this team for a lot of good reasons. They want, to, they want their team to get out there. They're going to get their wish this weekend against the Minnesota Vikings as the Raiders play their first preseason game. First preseason game. So for us in the media, it's we kind of some of us treat it as if it's the regular season, right? So you start off the week, you say, okay, there's a game at the end of this week now. Though it doesn't mm -hmm. count in the standings, it matters, especially for the Raiders because they have a quarterback competition going on we'll talk about. They have a corner competition going on and we'll talk about. And then other positions up for grabs. We want to see what the offense look, looks like. Antonio Pierce talked on Monday. So there's a lot going into this week. It, it feels like a regular season week and I'm ready for it. Yes, uh, me too. And there's a lot to talk about today. And the first thing we want to get into, I know we've been talking about quarterbacks, quarterbacks, and we're going to get to that because everybody wants to talk about the quarterbacks because it's one of the positions. We just don't know what's going to happen. We're hearing some conflicting things coming out of camp. We'll talk about that. But I wanted to start here because one of the other big question marks that we identified, Mo, through the offseason was the Raiders secondary. Now, we know Jack Jones, what a great pickup for this team, played really well since, since coming over uh, from the from the uh, Patriots and the fact that he knew Antonio Pierce from their days uh, earlier on from high school and so on. So he knew these guys. It seemed to be like a perfect fit. So you have Jack Jones. No surprise that he's doing well in camp. But we had questions about the other side corner. We thought maybe the Raiders would go make a move, and they still may, depending what happens. With a veteran, go out there. Some good veterans that are available. We talked about um, uh, a bunch of difference. Kyrie Jackson from the Giants, who seems like a natural fit because of Patrick Graham's familiarity with him. But what we're hearing now, great piece that I call you guys' attention to on The Athletic from over the weekend was kind of a after the first kind of nighttime scrimmage thing that they did down in Costa Mesa uh, was, was the notes of Tashawn Reed and Vic Tafer over at The Athletic. And one of the things they talked about was the secondary surging. OK, and uh, I want to just read this a little bit and get your reaction. It says, while the quarterbacks have been bad, we'll get to that later again, the secondary has been excellent in pass coverage. A starting unit has emerged of Jack Jones, Jacorian Bennett and Nate Hobbs at Nickelback. Uh, Morag get free safety and Marcus Epps at strong safety. And in fact, uh, even Antonio Pierce had has said, quote, they've really set the tone. The continuity of that group is really what you want. When I first got here three years ago, the DB group room was a little shaky. Now it's a tight knit group. Everybody was independent contractors. Now you don't see that. So, Mo, we look at this. We talked about Jacorian Bennett, one of your favorite guys uh, to talk about. But what we're hearing now, and again, you take camp with a grain of salt. I know they're not playing other people. But uh, if it was the other way, we'd be in serious trouble. And I think they would be thinking about maybe going out to get a veteran. But the fact that Jack Jones is doing what he does, but that Ja'Cory and Bennett has emerged on that outside, now the Raiders can think about maybe if they need some depth in other areas, offensive line, for example, since they're, they still have two, two unknowns there with the injuries to Colton Miller and Jackson Powers Johnson, now they can maybe think about other things and don't have to be as concerned about that defensive backfield. This is really good news. Yeah, I said it last week that part of the reason why the Raiders 
haven't signed a cornerback is maybe because Jacorian Bennett is really showing them that he's ready to take a second year leap. So I feel a little bit of vindication after being one of the loudest Jacorian Bennett supporters last year when they drafted him in the fourth round and then he got, you know, got he had some mistakes, got hurt, got benched last year. It looks like he's using this training camp to launch his second year leap. And I hope it translates to the preseason and translates to translates to the regular season because it's one thing to do well in practice. You got to carry it over to the next level. We're going to get to the next level Saturday when the Raiders kick off against the Vikings in the preseason. But it's definitely a good sign for that secondary. And then Vic Tafer, I think Vic Tafer and Tashawn in that piece also said that the secondary has come along. Yeah. Uh, while a lot of talk has been about the defensive line being one of the best in the league, that the secondary is really catching up. And and I want to not say catching up, but really earning its praise in the in the practices as well. So while the defensive line could be monstrous. Don't forget the secondary, which is coming along with Jacoby and Bennett opposite Jack Jones at cornerback. Right. And, and that is so important because we talked about, like you said, you just referenced it. We've talked about how that defensive front has gotten better, right? We talked about the fact that, of course, you got Max Crosby, but now you put in uh, you put in Christian Wilkins there, and they got some pressure on the inside. They have, of course, on the outside, some opportunity. Tyree Wilson, we're going to talk about Tyree Wilson in the entire se second segment, so hold on that one. But you look now that frees up that defensive front. So the defensive front, if you have great play by those defensive backfields on the back end, excuse me, defensive backs on the back end, mm -hmm. then you have the ability, I think, to do more up front. And what we're hearing about this defense now, there's a lot of hype coming out about this defense. I think from what we saw towards the tail end of last year, it's something you would expect. But this idea that not only the cornerbacks uh, and Jacorian Bennett particularly doing really well, we knew Nate Hobbs was going to do fine where he is. Uh, but then you look at the safeties, Mo, that is even better news because I think that we had some questions there too, right, about safety. Well, I had questions about who's going to be maybe the third safety. No questions about who the starting safeties are going to be. Marcus right. Epps and Trayvon America are, are entrenched in those spots. The question for me was who would be the third safety because Patrick Graham does use big nickel three safeties in his formations. Mm -hmm. I feel like it could be Isaiah Polamau. And if you read that piece from Tashari and Vic, the, Vic Tapia, the athletic, Isaiah Polamau had another interception in, over in the practice this past weekend. So, again, I, I said it in a sports not piece. I said it in my VR live stream last week. Every time I read about a practice or watch a preseason game, Isaiah Polamau is just making plays. He's always around the football. And I think it's going to help him earn a bigger bigger role this year. Rob Ryan said, watch out for Isaiah Polamau possibly carving out a bigger role. I think he's the guy that takes a leap among the safeties and gets that third safety spot. I also think, and I said this during my BR Live last week, that he could be the Raiders' backup nickel. So the Raiders have wow. not signed a backup nickel to replace Tyler Hall or Meek Robertson behind Nate Hops. Keep in mind, Nate Hops has missed 10 games over the last two seasons, so he hasn't been – the healthiest nickelback. So they might need a backup who can step in. And I think Isaiah Paul Mal could fill that role in the big nickel formation. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you too, there's some of the, some of the notes that have come out about the defense as well. And this is in the same piece, very, very informative. Also Vinny Dunson, you had some of the same information in his piece on the RJ, but they talked about Malcolm Kuntz, of course, doing well. Here's what I thought was really, um, really uh, uh, positive. Mo was that Adam Butler has, has really started to play really well and come into his own and also Byron young. These are player young players that we thought would make a jump. Now they didn't get to play a lot last year, Byron young, especially he played, I mean, maybe one or two games, I think it was, but he lost weight, got in better shape. Uh, and, and the word I keep hearing about him is matured and he's performing better. So again, to have that, that defensive line, mixed with these defensive backs and then the linebackers, of course, we know what's going on there and how they performed last year. And now the addition of uh, Tommy Eichenberg from Ohio state, this defensive unit, there's going to be a lot expected of it. And from what we're hearing about the quarterbacks, which we'll talk about too, um, it, it's good because I think this Raider defense for this team to stay on the cusp, I think of, of a, a nine or 10 win season to get into the playoffs. I know we picked them differently as far as the number of wins go, seven or eight. But if you go to this and you say nine or ten wins to get in the playoffs, probably ten, maybe, then um, this defense, I think, is going to have to play really inspired and be – we talked about it. I think they're going to have to be an elite unit if this team is going to really push that, that double-digit win mark. That was the only question mark of this defense. Can it be you – know, can it make a lump, uh, jump from being very good to elite was – Who's going to be the starting cornerback? You know, if you got Faison out there, 
could be a little shaky. If you're bringing in a veteran late in camp, could be a little shaky. If you have a rookie out there, the Cameron Richardson and MJ Devonshire could be a little shaky. It, it, it fell on Decorian and Bennett to make that leap. And if again, if he can, it's a complete unit from from the front line to to the to the linebackers to the secondary. You're hearing good news about the secondary right now. We saw what Robert Spillane did last year at linebacker. Divine Diablo, I'm not as high as on on him as other people are, but he he could be decent, especially on the early rundowns then you draft tommy eichenberg who a lot of people are very high on even though he's on the he's a fifth rounder mm-hmm. now you're looking at okay does this unit have any real weaknesses and and the answer to me if jacoya bennett is that guy to start there are no clear weaknesses in this defense right now yeah no no doubt about it and I, you like that and and then you look at some of the other players uh, that you would expect to to make a step step up. One of those, which uh, or one of which is Tyree Wilson, and we're going to talk to him in this or about him, I should say, in the second segment. So stick with us through that. Uh, we haven't heard a lot about those those linebackers, Mo. Um, I'm not worried about that. I think that just means they're doing their job. And again, it's not a sexy linebacking crew. Uh, I don't know that there are many there are too many of those in the NFL anyway. But I think that if you're getting the level of play you had last year from the linebackers increasing maybe with the addition of Eichenberg able to come in and rotate. Then you're talking about all three levels of that defense playing at a different level, playing better or at least as good as last year with it, with the improvement on the back end. And I think that that is very encouraging. Again, it's just training camp. We understand that, but I'm interested to see who plays even in the preseason game this weekend and what we see out of there. I think that'll, you start to read the tea leaves with guys who are playing versus aren't playing. Uh, and obviously competition like quarterback is different, uh, which is, is something that we we've talked about here before, but I think it's an encouraging sign. And I think we'll get to see a little more of some of these players who will be fighting for some of those rotational positions as we get into the preseason. I think we'll see a lot of Tommy Eichenberg and Luke Masterson in the preseason. Mm-hmm. I, you know, Robert Splane's a veteran. He he has his spot wrapped up, in my opinion. Probably leader in that locker room now after his year he had last year. I think you're going to see those two, Eichenberg and Matheson, try to push Divine Diablo for some snaps. Not to say that they're going to take his position, but let's remember Divine Diablo bulked up last year, had some issues in coverage. The, the numbers bear that out. A lot over 100 passer rating in coverage last year. Yeah. Regardless of how good he was against the run, could be a liability when you know the ball's in the, is in the air. So, if Tommy Eichenberg and Luke Masterson can can flash in coverage, it could really put a you know put a ceiling on Divine Diablo what he does in a contract year. Because remember, he's going to be a free agent next year, so he he wants to have a big year so that he can make some money on the market. But if he's if he has a limited role where Tommy Eichenberg and Luke Masterson are eating into his snaps, could make it difficult for him to cash out. Absolutely. All right. That's going to wrap up our first segment here on this edition, the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black. Today, when we get back, we're going to ask the question, how worried should you be about Tyree Wilson? Is Tyree Wilson, um, what's the word they use, Mo? Is he a bust? Is he disappointing? What is he? Here it comes. The we'll B-word. find out. Yes, we'll find out when we come back. This is Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Stay where you are. And for our video audience, by the way, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, BetUS. Uh, Here's a message with one Mr. Michael Vick about BetUS, official partner of Silver and Black today this year. Michael Vick at BetUS.com. Catch an incredible 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits plus 10% gambler's insurance. BetUS, my online sports book and casino. Welcome back again to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports Original Podcast, also heard on the radio in Las Vegas on 101.5 FM KDON and 98.5 The Bet. Scott Colbranson, Mo Moten, back with you. We are talking Raiders football. If you don't already subscribe to the show, please do wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on video, do the same there. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that notifications bell so you know when we have a new video. All right, we're going to continue the defensive conversation, but we're going to focus on one player right now. And that is Tyree Wilson. Tyree Wilson, of course, a number one draft pick for the previous regime. Dave Ziegler and McDaniels uh, chose him in the 2023 draft. Uh, had a dis- coming off an injury, so we knew that Tyree Wilson. And we talked a lot about it here, Mo, last season. We, we knew that it was going to take him some time to get into 
two games. We, he was awful to be in our good friend, uh, Mike Baldinger. Baldy was on our show, and he did a lot of videos last year about how bad Terry Wilson was at the beginning of the year, getting off the ball, all those types of things. Towards the end of the year, he seemed to get better. Was he to the level of like, oh, yeah, he's worth a first-round draft pick? Not yet, but you figured, hey, a full off season of workouts, full camp, mini camp, all the things that we get back. But what we're now hearing in the same report we talked about from Vic and Tashawn over at The Athletic was that, uh, hey, he might not be, he might not make the impact. Uh, he has trouble getting off the ball in practice, they've observed. And although he's happier and healthier, this is right from the piece, according to Pierce, the bar has been lowered quite a bit. Uh, and teammates saying, quote, he's taking baby steps. He really is. With him, I think it would be best for him just to be focused on one thing at a time. So, Mo, the concerning thing about this is, that when you you understand the injury, you understand it might take you a little bit, but now he's going into full camp, full year two, and we're we're still hearing baby steps. Well, okay, so he's kind of technically still a rookie in some ways, but that's got to be concerning because that that defensive unit, how good it's gotten, and what they're doing up front to have a player that you spent a first round draft pick on, even if it was the previous regime, to hear feedback like this in camp early is not good. Yeah, remember, I think a week or two ago, I said I had three fingers on the panic button for the offensive line. <laughs> I have four fingers on the panic button for Tyree Wilson right now yeah. because let's call it what it is. This is regression. Yes. Uh, at worst, I mean, at best, is stagnation. It's he's stagnant because yeah. if you're if you're a top eight, top seven pick in a draft, you're expected. Now we we you you said it. He had foot surgery last offseason. We kind of all knew he was going to have a slow ramp up into the regular season. We all expected that coming off injury. But now you're going into your second year healthy, and you're your top seven pick. You, you're expected to make some, you know, make some strides. And when you're hearing a player had the same problems he had in the previous year as a rookie, you start to get a little concerned. And the and the and what's most concerning is the way Vic. Or to Sean, whoever wrote the headline or the subheader for that for that takeaway said, Tyree Wilson may not have an impact. Not that yeah. the fact that he may have a slow ramp up, not the fact that he may have minimal impact. He may have no impact yeah. with that defensive line. That is concerning because though he's not starting, a lot of good defense. We talked about how do you have an elite, how do you put together an elite defense? A lot of elite defenses have more than two solid pass rushes on the edge. Now, Notre Dame may have three with Christian Wilkins on the inside, but a lot of elite defenses have a designated pass rusher, a third down pass rusher who comes in and kind of spells the two starters. And that's what Tyree Wilson's role should be this year, being that he's not starting because Malcolm Coons had his breakout year last year. If Tyree Wilson isn't able to fill that role, and let's say the Raiders go out and sign a veteran, I think that's the that's the full hand panic button move, right? Yes. Here. If the Raiders go out and sign another veteran edge rusher, I know they have Janarius Robinson on the roster who came along last year from the Vikings. But if they sign another veteran edge rusher before week one, and that veteran edge rusher has some starting experience, maybe as a third down pass rusher, and possibly could kick Tyree Wilson down to the fourth edge rusher, that's full scale panic right there. That That's them mm -hmm. saying, we agree with Vic Tafer and Tashawn. We don't think he's going to make an impact. We better sign another veteran edge rusher to spell Max Crosby and Malcolm Coons. Well, and remember, even though they had the regime change, the defensive side of the ball, for the most part, the coaching staff is the same. So this isn't this isn't like a new coaching staff coming in saying, well, he's not our guy. I'm, not, I'm going to give him a chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the possibility, Mo, that he doesn't make the roster in year two? I mean, it depends how bad it is, right? I mean, if, if you look at it and say this guy is just not – anything near what we thought now we he showed some promise towards the end of last year so i would think that they wouldn't maybe cut him this year but if they go like you said if they go sign a veteran pass rusher then that tells you that he's not going to see the field very much and if he doesn't see the field very much and he's just there for a depth piece or for rotation down here or there then i would anticipate that even after this year despite the fact being on his rookie contract and as much money as they paid hey man you need that roster spot you need somebody who can make a difference especially if this defense does what everyone thinks it can do it's absolutely nuts to me that we're already talking about like is I know. Terry Wilson gonna gonna make it through his rookie contract and we you know we're year two into his rookie deal. Like I, I absolutely feel like he's going to make the roster. Mm -hmm. I don't think he gets cut or traded, you know, but nothing surprises me. But if he if he's unable to make an impact this year, 
that is that is that's worse than Cleve Farrell because at least Cleve yes. Farrell was he on was the field. Like he was overdrafted. Like he like his second year. Like we get like he regressed as his years went on. But Cleve Farrell was at least a, a presence on rundowns. Like he was on the field. He just wasn't a starting rotational player. Of course, yeah. you want more than that from your fourth overall pick. But if Tyree Wilson is unable to make any impact, rundowns or pass downs, that to me, that even though he was seventh pick and Cleve Farrell was four, to me, that's worse because that means your guy is struggling to even get on the field. And 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 for for you to be picked seventh and his and his physical profile, the one thing that we talked about is that the upside lies in his physical profile that he's a he's you know he's bigger than than some guys who's going to go up against and faster than, than some of the defensive tackles he may go against if he moves inside if they can't find a way to utilize him that's a big problem because as you said this is while Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniels aren't there anymore you know Patrick Graham I'm sure had a big say in drafting sure. yeah. Tyree Wilson and Patrick Graham is still there because he's the D coordinator you know a lot of the a lot of the defensive coaches are still there and for mm-hmm. them to whiff that bat on a guy who who may not be able to make an impact in his second year healthy, that's a big swing and a miss, right there. Yeah, and I listen. I defended Tyree Wilson last year. A lot of a lot of listeners and viewers. Oh, he's a bust. He's a bust. Like after three or four weeks, I'm like, come on, you don't know that. Now, I'm I'm, ha- I'm if I'm wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong. But this is just concerning. Mm-hmm. And like you said, I don't have all five fingers on the panic button either. But it's getting close. Because again, again, Mo, if this defense reaches now, we don't know if they will, but I think they can perhaps if they reach elite status, you can't have stuff dragging you down. You can't have players that you can't use when you know what I'm saying. And I understand the money invested and he's only in his second year and he really didn't play half the first half of last year. I get that. So it's going to be how much you, you know, if they like him a lot and they want to give him every opportunity to turn it around, they will. What's most concerning to me, and this is what Baldy pointed out last year, and it seemed to get better at the end of the year, so I don't know why he's regressed, the speed, getting off the ball. You know, we've seen this before, Mo. We've seen first-round, second-round draft picks, highly touted, who once they get to the pro level, it's not like they lose their talent. It's just the game is so much faster, and some guys just can never make the adjustment. Right, and and as you said, the concerning thing is that he – he got better getting off the ball. Yeah. You know, in the second half last year, like a lot of people were focusing on that and paying attention to that when he first got on the field in some capacity. And then it seemed to improve, not, not, you know, significantly, but moderately improved as the year went on. And for him to now kind of, I guess that's why I say it's a bit of a regression to now take a step back where it's a major problem again. And he's not able to shed blocks to get to the quarterback or get, you know, make an attack at the line of scrimmage. That's, that's concerning because yeah. you would expect a guy of his strength and his again physical profile to be able to shed those blocks and get into the backfield and be able to get off the ball. And and, and I think the fact that he's lining up not far from Max Crosby, who's great at getting off the ball, he, you know, you can't you're not able to take some pointers from that. Now you can't be Max Crosby and make yourself better. Able to do that, mm-hmm. big problem. It's a big problem, and I think that again, um, when you look at it and and you see, you see comments like he's taking baby steps. Well, okay, last year as an injured rookie, I get that, like no problem. But in year two, hearing say because we saw the pictures of him being in such great shape, all this stuff, and now you're hearing, well, he's taking baby steps. Well, how long does he need to develop? If you a, a guy who gets picked seventh overall. You expect more out of you understood last year with the injury at the beginning of the season. They knew he was injured when they drafted him. Okay. But now the expectation has to be higher because the expectation on this defense is much higher. And he's part of that. And I think that um, it's definitely something to watch. You know, if we get past this first game and he's, he's not making any impact as the guys said in their piece, then boy, I, it, it's just a tough one to deal with for this Raiders team. But We'll see. Hopefully, every someone steps in and and does the job there, or like you said, they go out and get a veteran. Really quick, I want to say this though. I'm, I'm, we're pointing out the concern with Tyree Wilson. We're not saying mm-hmm. that this is the end all be all, and he's not going to be anything this year. But right. what we're saying is that there, the early concerning signs are there right now. Not getting off the ball, not being able to shed blocks. Vic, Vic and Tashaun saying may not make an impact again not that he will make a minimal impact may not make an impact period yeah and again that's that's the wording there is concerning for me so 
now he could go out in the preseason, he could completely wreck it and then yeah. quiet all the, the concerns and doubts and critics out there. And then we can just say, okay, maybe it's just a blip in the road. Maybe it's just practice, whatever. But right now we're, we're looking at a situation where, again, I think he's going to make the roster. I don't think that's a question for me. It's do they sign another veteran to skip him on the depth chart? Because if hmm. they do that, then that's telling you they don't think he's going to make an impact either. Very well. You'll we'll have to watch the waiver wire, see what the Raiders do there. Uh, and we'll see, I think, this week and then after the the preseason game this weekend, uh, how that goes. Like you said, if he's not making an impact there and they start to pull some triggers on, on signing some veterans or whatever, it'll be interesting to follow that one as well. Real quick before we go to the break, Mo, because I don't want to I don't want to kick the, the the dead horse, so to speak, but we also heard conflicting reports on the quarterback play. One report said Gardner Minshew had kind of taken a jump up based on the 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 scrimmage the other night on Friday night. Um at, because because he just performed better. Aiden O'Connell seemed to struggle through more turnovers. And um again, it's early, I think, as you and I said last show. I think the preseason games are going to have a lot of impact on who gets this job. But uh, what did you, what was your takeaway from those kind of conflicting reports? I had some, some other reporters have said that are on the ground there have said, Hey, it's nobody's game yet. It's nobody's job yet. They didn't give anybody an edge, but then we're hearing some other reports that give Minshew an edge just based on Friday. So here are my, here's my take on how does, you know, cite, decipher through these reports where there are conflicting reports. Mm -hmm. Usually I say, there are a few reporters that are uh, that are reputable that you can, I don't say believe every word, but when they say something, you your ears perk up and you listen. There are certain, I'm not, and, and I just want to make this clear, just because you're at practice doesn't mean that the that whoever is there is giving you the full story. Right. They may be giving you their side or their spin <laughs> of what they saw. So just keep that in mind about the reports that you read at camp. So what I'd like to do is like to say, okay, the majority of people coming out of camp, what are they saying? What is the majority viewpoint of these practices? If, is it just one or two reporters saying something different or is it 50-50? And from mm -hmm. my perspective, from what I've read, most of the people have said that Gardner Minshew has taken the lead in this quarterback battle. Maybe not by a large margin, yeah, but he, sure he has a slight edge there. I listen to guys like Q, our guy over there at Radio Nation Radio 920 AM. He had his 100 yards of thoughts that he does every morning. Mm -hmm. And he said Gardner Minshew has stacked good practices from Wednesday. And I trust Q. I, Q does not. I, I listen to Q no. a lot. He doesn't. I, I know, he, he doesn't rah-rah. He tells you the truth. Right. He tells, he tells you the complete truth, no chaser. Right. He will tell you if a guy isn't playing well, if, if he is practicing well. Yeah. And I trust Q. And like I said, I got on Monday morning. First thing I did was look at Q's 100 yards of thoughts. Gardner Minshew has a slight, he said slight edge, I believe. Yeah. So he's not saying that Gardner Minshew is blowing Aiden O'Connell out of the water. But what he's saying is that Gardner Minshew, here's a C word that I like to talk about, Scott, has shown some consistency. Consistency, yes. Right? So over the past weekend during that practice, Gardner Minshew did throw an interception, but it was reported in multiple reporters said this, that the pass went through Trey Tucker's fingers. So yeah. maybe not all on on Gardner Minshew with that interception. But they did say that Aiden O'Connell, and this is Vic Tafer's word, Sean Reed's word from that piece in The Athletic, that Aiden O'Connell was pressing a bit, and that may have led to his two interceptions over the weekend in that live practice where Mark Davis attending. So there's one thing I want to point out, Scott. Owner is at attendance now. This is <laughs> not just coaches. This is now Mark Davis watching. And I'm not saying Mark Davis medals. No. But when the owner's watching, you want to have your best performance. And sure. Aiden Kyle didn't have his best performance with Mark Davis in attendance. So just keep that in mind. Well, we talked about it. We both felt that that, that Aiden O'Connell had an edge going in to, to yeah. camp as, as a starter. But I also pointed out, if you remember, that you know it's different when you know you're competing for the job versus last year when Aiden O'Connell did so well during – he was the best quarterback in the NFL in the preseason, right? And he did well in spots during the season when he took over after the firing of McDaniels. But it's much different when you go into camp and it's like, okay, dude, whoever wins this gets the starting job. It's very different. Even if you're a second-year player, I mean, as a rookie, it would be crazy. But as a second-year player, it's still difficult. He's inexperienced. And so that pressure, I think, can get to people. We'll see if he can turn it around. I think that's going to be the interesting thing to watch this week. Now, again, I still – and I think initially we say Gardner Minshew would win. But then – yeah. But then, like I said, with, with logic, you would think logically speaking, 
Aiden O'Connell with the experience with the some of the supporting cast, most of the supporting cast he's playing with will have the edge there. Mm-hmm. And as I pointed out last week, Aiden O'Connell was, as you said, guard, pretty good in the preseason. Different when you're competing for the starting job because he was. We knew Jimmy Garoppolo was going to be the guy, so a different type of level of pressure now. Yeah. But I, I just felt like in a less complex offense, I still feel like Aiden O'Connell will close the gap once the preseason game starts. So a lot of people now yo-yoing back their opinions <laughs> saying, well, I think Gardner Minshew is going to win the job now it, because a lot of reporters are saying that Gardner Minshew has the edge. And I say, look, and Q said this on Monday morning, while, God, he, while he feels like Gardner Minshew has the edge, there's still a lot left to go. We still sure. have three preseason games. And That's we three don't days. Know how, we, you know, we don't know how these quarterbacks are going to perform in the preseason. And again, if Aiden O'Connell looks good in the preseason and tightens that race and you're choosing between Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell on an even playing field, you'll probably go with the younger quarterback to see what he's got because he could possibly have a significant leap in his second year. We'll see. Right. But Big Tafer also pointed out, and I pointed this out when they signed Gardner Minshew, is that he's got bridge quarterback money. Now, yeah. you can argue and debate what bridge quarterback money is. The fact of the matter is they signed him to a two-year, $25 million deal, $15 million guaranteed. You don't give a quarterback that if you don't feel like he can win the job. Yeah. If you felt like Aiden O'Connell is probably our guy, you probably go after a quarterback, you give $5 million to a Mitch Trubisky or something like that. But two years, $25 million with $15 million guaranteed is a significant chunk of money. And you don't give a quarterback that unless you feel like he legitimately could steal the job from the incumbent. So we'll see. I think it's still going to be a close battle. Well said. All right, that wraps up segment number two here on Silver and Black today. When we come back, we're going to get to your calls and text messages. That's right. It's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. Don't go anywhere. Moan Scott coming right back. Raider Nation, Scott Branson here at Silver and Black today. Are you looking for a new sports book this football season? BetUS is the answer. They offer the fastest payouts in the industry with 125% sign-up bonus up to $2,000 or a 200% crypto deposit bonus. Enjoy a fast and easy deposit and withdrawal process with 24-7 personalized service, 365 days a year. BetUS provides live wagering on all major games and the best betting variety in the business. Plus, get 10% back on your net losses twice a year. Did you know that BetUS can give you your very own personal account manager? Check out the special offer from Silver and Black today. Use our BetUS link found below in the description, and good luck. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from From you. Any Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. That that, that black hole rocking and rolling. rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right. Welcome back. Silver and Black Today, Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. If you don't subscribe, please do so. Scott Cobranson, Mo Moten with you. We appreciate it. And this is the time, by the way, Mo, you know, since I moved, this is the first time since I moved away from Las Vegas that um, I really have been like, damn, humidity sucks. Like, you know, they talk about Vegas, the dry heat, because it's my, my son's still obviously there going to school. And he's like, yeah, it's been 115 for like the last four days. And I remember those days were tough. Can't walk the dog during the day, you burn their paw, all that kind of stuff. But man, I'll tell you what, in the Midwest, I know you've had it there in New York as well. The, the the humidity the last week or so and it's it's actually getting worse now um uh where i'm at and it's like damn i want that dry heat i i'll tell you scott i barely left my cave for the past <laughs> three days because it's yeah. also been raining and not to yes. give you guys got a lot of rain there weather report but we also got rain out here so i've been able to just kind of stay inside under the cool air and just kind of Look over things, Raider football reports, what's going on around the league, just kind of chilling out before Raider football kicks off on Saturday. Yes, and uh, of course, this is the time of the show where we get into your phone calls and text messages. If you want to take part in that and you want to be on the next show, uh, give us a call, 702-900-7869. That's uh, 702-900-7869. You can leave us a voicemail message there, name where you're calling from, and then your comment or question. Or if you want to text us because you're too shy, go ahead and do that. Even if you're not shy and you just like to text versus talk on the phone, 
totally fine. So please do that. Uh, and we will get your stuff. Uh, we'll get your call on the air. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is read a text message that we got in. Uh, this is someone who's done it for the first time. And it says, Hey, my name is Mark from Boyle Heights, which is down in Los Angeles. I would love both of your inputs on the Raiders possibly uh, putting uh, sitting. Oh, sitting put with quarterback next draft and getting Carson Beck Bowers would be great intel and i've heard how beck might be available in the mid first round obviously if aoc doesn't work out i think that fits perfectly to how telesco drafts staying at the spot and not moving up or down and the raiders possibly draft their future quarterback love the content guys keep it up again that's mark from boyle heights mark thanks for the text carson beck mo tell me what you think i think it's very early to <laughs> <laughs> i mean probably an option if they're assuming the Raiders go quarterback but you know how it goes with these college football seasons, Scott. We we often have certain quarterbacks pegged to be at the top of the draft, and then some yeah. guy has a has a spectacular year and he shoots up the, the charts. I don't have any real strong thoughts thoughts on Carson Beck right now because I haven't really been paying attention to Carson Beck. I've been so knee deep in in pro football and what's going on with the NFL and training camps. But I will say that I mean chances of him being a first round pick are you know obviously very high. And he's probably going to be on the Raiders' radar. They're probably going to be scouting him because, let me tell you, the scouting for these NFL teams doesn't start after the college football season ends. It's already started. They're it's scouting. Already started. They've yes. had they've had they've had these players on their radar years before. Mm -hmm. So they, I'm sure they have their eye on him. I want to see how he does this season before I even attempt to make a, a expert opinion on it. <laughs> uh, but he he you know he's probably a first round pick and probably on the Raiders' radar at this point. Yes, and I'll just point out that the reason somebody like this, or excuse me, somebody like Mark from Boyle Heights, excuse me, Mark, for not forgetting your name, I should remember it's my son's name, but nonetheless, uh, Mark, I think part of this is because of the uncertainty with the quarterback of the Raiders. Now, if Aiden O'Connell or, or Gardner Minshew starts off three and one, I think people will be less concerned about if they're going to get a quarterback next year, not saying that they don't need to be because you do need a long-term answer and you don't know if either one of these guys, which I say no, is a long-term answer. But that's what uncertainty does is you have fans, even though we got a whole season ahead of us and we don't have enough even on Carson Beck to see how he performs this year at Georgia, it certainly talks to people being uncomfortable necessarily with the situation with the Raiders right now. So, all right, Mark, thanks for that uh, text. We appreciate it. Again, if you want to get in on this, 702-900-7869 is a number. All right, our first caller is Raider Heck down in Whittier. He's, I think this is the second time he's called. I called him a few weeks ago. Here's Raider Heck. Hello, oh, hey, this is Raider Heck from Whittier. Uh, I called in uh, last week or, or something like that. Uh, about the <laughs> skeptic. Uh, also, uh, yeah, Scott, I knew about the Richard Nixon thing. Uh, but I think now when I call in, I think we've also got to throw in City of Whittier, birthplace of Pizza Mania. There you go, Pizza Mania. <laughs> yeah. You guys ever in the neighborhood and get a slice? It'd be saying Richard who, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I called in about the skeptic uh, thing and I wasn't, it wasn't for, you know, I don't want to come across as a whiner little, uh, uh, little baby, uh, you know, cause of the penalties. I mean, in my, my lifetime Raiders have won three championships, probably leading the league in penalties and dominated a few other leagues or a few other seasons with, with probably leading the league in penalties. Uh, but it was mostly for the younger younger fans and uh uh the, the the some of the people out there that are still thinking it's a dysfunctional organization just because a knucklehead in the media says that <laughs> uh you know dysfunctional organization dysfunctional ownership uh I mean, it's a lot of bs i mean i've seen a lot of games i've had money on games you know i've done a bunch of money line and parlays and uh seeing some crooked stuff go down for the raiders and, uh and, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons I started looking at your guys' show because uh, Mo Moten, I was taking his picks. Uh, it made me a couple of dollars. All right. Uh, nothing, uh, not a whole lot, nothing to, you know, like send him a check or anything. For his <laughs> picks, but, uh, you know, but, yeah, I seen a bunch of games and, uh, uh, shoot. Now I think about it, I think Mo owes me some money for taking all his bad picks. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, no, I just oh, uh, so funny. Uh, I'll be looking at your pics this year, anyways, too, Bo. You and uh, Davenport, I think the guy's name is. But anyways, yeah, the skeptic thing. Just I don't know. Big, you guys could I don't know, not mention it, but throw it out there once in a while, just so the younger fans know it's, uh, the organization in the, ain't as bad as people say, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all I got. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, right on, and uh, go Raiders. There you go, Raider Heck with his call from Whittier. Good stuff. And you know what? I will I will reach out to the ethical skeptic. That's who he was talking about. We had him on our show a couple times over the years. It's been a few years now, so I'll, I'll reach out to him, see if he's got any updates, uh, because obviously the Raiders had a pretty good year last year when it came to penalties. Uh, but, but he does bring up another good point, and it doesn't have to do with your betting. By the way, Mo and I are going to be doing picks here because our video sponsor, BetUS, we're going to have some cool stuff going on there. So get ready for that. And, and uh, Mo will send you a check Raider heck for those bad picks. So, he got. So, um, so, so Raider heck, the first pick you need to make Raiders over six and a half wins over oh, yeah. bet us. Make sure you make that one. I, mm -hmm. I believe it's minus minus one thirty, uh, or minus one thirty five over at, over at bet us. We'll have the graphic up before week one of the season kicks off, but it's going to raise the stakes because we got bet us on board, Scott. So mm -hmm. we, we gotta, we gotta be, well above 50 percent on our picks this year so Ray can, can make some of his shekels back <laughs> yes there you go the one thing he did bring up that i want to address too because we did there was some negativity some some national folks i think colin coward went on a rant about how bad the raiders were and all this kind of stuff and what's remarkable i'm not excusing because the raiders from a football perspective going back to 2002 right we know the, the history one playoff game win since then all that's there's been nothing right it's been terrible everybody knows that raider nation knows that nobody's arguing with that there's been dysfunction from the standpoint of head coaches a lot of head coaches coming through including recently but what what's remarkable to me mo is that these same people do they 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 go crazy about the chargers every year the los angeles chargers and i would argue that that organization is even more dysfunctional because they've had no excuse several times. Now, the injury thing, I get it, whatever. For whatever reason, they can't keep people uh, healthy, including Justin Herbert this year. But you look at that and, and the Spanos group and what they've done with that franchise, it's been brutal. And I would argue that's worse. When you have all that talent and you have teams that are supposed to go far, you get picked to go to the Super Bowl two out of five years and you don't even make the playoffs, that's even worse. I'm not excusing the Raiders falling short because they have in many, many ways. But it is remarkable how people's lenses can differ. Scott, remember when I said be careful about whose practice reports you read and listen to because they, they're going to give you their own spin on things? Yes. The same goes for media pundits you listen to. Mm -hmm. So Scott and I pride ourselves on being objective down the middle. We, we, don't, we try to play favorites. We tell you straight how we see it. But when you watch TV... And you watch whoever you watch. I'm not going to call out any specific names, but whoever you watch on TV, a lot of those people, a lot of those media pundits on TV, they have slants too. Yes. I mean, they have relationships. They have relationships we don't know about to certain organizations. So they're going to be a lot softer with certain organizations. Mm -hmm. I will say, I will. I said I was going to name names, but I will say about Colin Cowherd is that he had a relationship with the, a bit of a relationship with the Chargers organization when Tom Telesco was there. I don't know where that relationship is now, but I remember one year specifically the Chargers had invited him into their draft room while Tom Telesco was there. So if he's being soft a bit on the Chargers or harder on the Reds than the Chargers, just understand that there was a relationship there. I don't know what it is now. Again, mm -hmm. no idea what it is now. I'm not going to speak on that. But Colin Cowherd was invited to the Chargers draft room at some point of time when Tom Telesco was there. So if you're wondering why maybe he had been a little soft on the Chargers dysfunction, if that's what you want to call it, versus the Raiders dysfunction, the disarray, yeah, whatever you want to call it, yeah. it, it, there were some backdoor relationships that you need to understand exist at that time. Well put. All right, we're going out to uh, Stabler's Ghost out in New England. Gully, Mo Mountain. <laughs> this is Stabler's Ghost calling back yet again. It was only a day or two ago, but... Mr. Mo, you gave me so much love on my Raiders call that I had to call back. And don't worry, I won't disappoint at the end of this call. <laughs> I'm talking about the defensive backfield. Mm. And I know that Jack Jones is set. I know there's question marks on the other side, on the outside. Jacorian Bennett, 
from how it sounds has a, a leg up on the competition. And I know a lot of people have been talking about DeCamrian Richardson. I want to say, what about MJ Devonshire? I watched a lot of DeCam's uh, film, and I know why he didn't get a pick in college. Because he couldn't get his head around. Mm. He couldn't turn around and find the ball. He would blanket wide receivers in man-to-man. So much so that he stopped a lot of receptions by getting hit in the back of the helmet or in the back by the ball. Mm. But he didn't turn around and he didn't find it. And a lot of times that made him look a little bit lost. Then I watched MJ Devonshire's tape and he was a ball hawk. He didn't have the speed of DCAM, but he had more awareness in the defensive backfield. And I don't know if he's a little older. I'm not sure. But he just looked a little more certain of himself. And I'm going to say that I think MJ Devonshire will wind up being uh, somebody that we keep that is going to contribute, at least in dime packages. Um, As always, you guys are the best. And let's go Raiders! (laughs) There it is. Woo! There it is. All right, there, there we it go. Is. Stabler's ghost. Get a cough Stabler's drop, brother. Ghost. Get a cough drop. <laughs> Get a cough drop. <laughs> he, he's gonna wear it out. Uh, M- MJ Devonshire, guy you've talked about since we since the since we did the draft show. Yes. Um, and he had a pick uh, on the scrimmage on Friday mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. I, I've been saying Stabler's ghost. I've been saying this the, since the day of the draft, day three. I, I've I've said this and I stick to this. I think MJ Devonshire is gonna see the field quicker or a lot more than the Cameron Richardson early in their careers. Yeah. And, and Stables goes, you know, pointed out the film on, on Richardson or why he, he doesn't have, you know, the interceptions. And I said the opposite about MJ Devonshire. One thing about him is he makes plays on the football. And yeah. the one thing, you know, or should know about these defenses of defensive coaches is if you can force turnovers, you're going to get on the field. If you're a, and I talked about this with this, with Isaiah Polo Mao, why he should carve out a bigger role this year is that if you, if you're just constantly around the football, if you have a tendency to be at least around the football and, and have the awareness to, as Stables go said, to pick it off as MJ Devonshire does, you will get on the field. Now, I think the reason why MJ Devonshire was a seven round pick partially because yeah, sometimes he lets he lets uh he allows some big plays, but he's five he's about five eleven, under two hundred pounds. So he's not the physical specimen that DeCameron Richardson is mm-hmm. in that sense. But I think he can contribute. I think he can also be a backup nickel if he if he can you know fit the run very well. I think he can also play that role now. That role now, Stables Go said dime packages. I can also see that as well. But he is my sleeper of this draft class. Because I, I do think that with this defense trying to make the jump to an elite level, having a guy who could be around the football and get some interceptions. Now, we saw Jack Jones do that, right, last mm-hmm. year when he came on. If you can have another cornerback who could get on the field in certain packages, sub packages, and pick the ball off and turn the field to the offense, that's going to be an asset. And I think Devin Shire definitely makes the roster, in my opinion. And I think he can actually, as Steve Go said, make some contributions as well. All right. Great call as usual, Steve Go. Our next caller is Anders from Oakland. Hey, fellas, it's Anders from Oakland. It's been a couple of weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. Thank you for taking my call. Not that you have any choice. Uh, <laughs> you guys know that I'm sort of the guy from Dumb and Dumber. Like, uh, so you say there's a chance to go to the playoffs. <laughs> um, I'm kind of looking at 13 and 4. Uh, wow. But if I take a step back, uh, it's kind of hard to blame the media for putting us at what six and a half as the over under. So let's take a quick peek. Our head coach has nine games under his belt. Number two, we have an offensive coordinator that wasn't exactly like Mike Shanahan or Kyle Shanahan when he was in Chicago. We have an all pro running back who left was giving way to a guy who played four games. Our corner two, Bennett, was largely MIA last year. We don't exactly have, like, Ronnie Lott at safety. We have a potentially immature 
sort of hot-headed cornerback one. We have a slot corner with an injury history. We have two linebackers, and they you know, might have been flashes in the pan, or they could be really good. We're the only team without a QB one. And we have Cliff Branch, except he drops everything <laughs> thrown his way. But we're all talking about, oh, our D-line and Devante, 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 Devante. And, oh, oh, there's, there's Jacoby Myers. Yeah, you know, sort of a similar combo to that didn't exactly put the Chargers in the Super Bowl. Oh, we got Mayer, Bowers and Mayer. And these tight ends, I, I agree, they have, like, huge potential. But they're, like, barely old enough to get a drink at a bar. <laughs> I can't blame the media at all. A lot of things have to go right for this team to win 10 games. I think they will, of course. But as the saying goes, hope ain't a strategy. (laughs) What really do you guys think they need to do? Not what needs to happen, but what do we really need to do to get to the place where we need to be? Thank you so much. Mm. You guys are the best. Bye now. Great, great call from Anders. As usual, in Oakland, so thank you very much for that. Boy, that's a tough one. We could spend a whole segment talking about this, Mo. But um, real quickly, I think that I think he's right as far as you know. The media look; some are just negative about the Raiders. You get that. You can you can smell through that. Others, though, you as he pointed out, you look at the question marks the Raiders have. Right? You might not, as a fan, have the question marks, but they do. Watching football, and and he brought up a lot of them there. And so I think when you look at this Raiders team, what would they need to do? for me to think they've made that jump. I think it is just be a more complete team, a more consistent team. There's that word again, Mo, uh, on offense and defense and really have players have depth to where if someone's hurt, if someone doesn't play well day, you have somebody else who can at least step in and perform at a level that's going to keep the team uh, in a position to win the football game. So Anders, I have a I have a direct answer for you about what do the Raiders need to do specifically to get where they need to be. And I'll I'll limit it to this year. For the Raiders to get to the playoffs this year, they need to do two things. Their defense needs to play at a very high level. I don't care how optimistic you are about Garner Minshew or Aiden O'Connell. Garner Minshew could be the next Rich Gannon. Aiden O'Connell could be the next Kirk Cousins or whoever the, you know, whoever the comparison is. That defense needs to play at a high level. Because if the defense doesn't play at a high level, because I feel like the offense is going to have some struggle stretches. Sure. And the defense is going to have to carry, you know, carry that game, keep keep the score close, maybe score a touchdown or two here and there like they did last year for them to win some football games against some of the high-powered offenses they're going to face. The other thing the Raiders need to do if they want to be a playoff team, they have to shore up the offensive line. So we mm. talked about the previous weeks, Colton Miller being out. We hope he's back before week one, obviously. Jax Powers Johnson, uh, Tom Sesko said he'll be back in a short order. He has a concussion. At least that's what Vic Tafer and, and Tashawn Reed wrote in the athletic piece that we talked about in segment one. That's why he's out, a concussion or concussion symptoms. Now they're also saying that the reason why DJ Glaze was running with the first team over this past weekend in practice was because their Mumford Jr. has a hand injury. So mm. now you're looking at three banged up offensive linemen and possibly two filling stars in Austin, uh, Andrews Pete and Cody Whitehead filling on the, on the left side and then maybe a rookie at right tackle. That's not a good recipe for success because if, you're, if your offensive line has all these new parts and some inexperience there, some guys who may be past their prime, you're going to struggle to run the football and protect your quarterback. So the Raiders, to me, in my opinion, if, if they are up for – if their Mumford Jr.'s injury lingers, they need to sign one or two offensive linemen to make sure that they have pass protection, solid pass, quality pass protection, and some good run blocking because without a quality offensive line, your offense isn't going to go very far. Well said. All right, we're going to get to our next call. We're running out of time here on the Tuesday edition. Here is Jacob from Fresno. You know, this will be a doozy. Yeah. Gilly, 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 come from Spain. And many, many, many down motion. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? Listen, uh, I'm a little off kilter this week. I went on v- vacay and I uh, haven't listened to the show <laughs> on Tuesday yet. It is Wednesday night. I'm going to check it out. I don't know if you guys are doing a show this Thursday, but I am sending a call anyway. If not, just play it next week. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Anywho. 
I got two things I want to talk about, and I can't remember either of them right now, so I'm going to try. For, okay, first thing, quarterback, obviously. Obviously, we're talking about the quarterback. Aiden O'Connell, by all reports that I'm seeing, seems to be distancing himself from Gardner and shooting <laughs> in a bad way. And Gardner seems to be showing his sure-footedness in the pocket, and he seems to be the guy for right now. Who knows? It's still very early. It's just a week in padded practice right now. So... With that in mind, if neither of those guys turn out to be the guy and we get in a situation like week seven, week eight, and a trade seems to be a possibility, is it possible that we go out and get a guy like Geno Smith from the Seahawks or Sam Howell from the Seahawks or Hendon Hooker from the Detroit Lions, who is very old man on his rookie contract? I think he's, what, 27? And he's in his second year? This guy can be something great, in my opinion. Now, that's not worth too much, but it is my opinion. I want to see what do you guys think about that. Also, the second thing I want to hear from you guys, this Jack Jones fella, the guy who made two incredible six, uh, pick sixes last year, and one of them was a one-handed beauty that I've never seen anything made me fall in love. It was love at first sight, this kid. And he's so tiny, he's such a little guy. But he's so fast at the same time, and he still hits like a truck because he's so fast. It's crazy. I think this guy is a superstar. Now, I want you guys to say, okay, pump the brakes, and tell me why I should pump the brakes on Jack Jones. Or say, you know what, Jake, you, you, you seem like you're, uh, you're onto something there. This guy does look like a superstar. I think those two pick sixes are going to be a normal thing. Maybe we're going to see a pick six every single year. Maybe he's going to be one of those guys that gets five, six, eight, ten interceptions, and he has a great all-pro season. I'm going to run out of time, and I appreciate you guys. Let me know what you're thinking. Go <laughs> Raiders. There's Jacob and Fresno with our final call of the day. Listen, Mo, uh, I'm, I'm with him on Jack Jones, but it goes back to, so he came in, New atmosphere, all that. He did great. I got to see it again this year. If 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 he starts off well and does what what we saw last year, great. I think he's got that potential. He's always had that potential as a young guy. It's been sort of the attitude stuff, which didn't show up in Las Vegas last year. Now he's here for a full season, so I'll see that. On the quarterback stuff, I don't get the Geno Smith thing. Hendon Hooker's not going anywhere, Jacob. Hendon Hooker is the guy that they're looking at as the future in Detroit. Now, he may not be but I don't think they're going to give up. We've talked about him. Somebody called in about that during the early part of the summer, I think, Mo, if I remember. But I think the Raiders, why would you bring in Geno Smith? Is Geno Smith that much better outside of that one season than Gardner Minshew? I I, I don't think so. He's older, uh, has more injury issues. So from my perspective, I think the Raiders, the answer isn't to go get another quarterback this year. The answer is you got to play with what you got, and then you assess for next season. So I'll start with Jack Jones. Jack Jones is actually a pretty good college football player. Just has yes. some off the field issues. Had if not for those off the field issues, he probably would have gone earlier than the fourth round to the Patriots. So Jack, it was never a question about Jack Jones' ability. It's can he, you know, walk a straight and narrow and and stay focused. And so far under AP, he's been focused. So I think he could be, you know, a top cornerback in this league. Now, I, I maybe he's a version of Marcus Peters in his prime where he's getting those interceptions and making plays. Mm -hmm. And he's he's kind of like, you know, a George Acker on the field, but he backs it up with his play, with those pick sixes, with those interceptions being a ball hawk. Now, I, I think, as you said, consistency is key. We'll see if he can put it together for two consecutive seasons. I think he can. About the quarterback it. situation, I think it all depends on where the Raiders are. I, th I think Jacob from Fresno brought it up that let's say the Raiders are in the playoff hunt middle of the season, and they and let's say Garner Minshew isn't it, Aiden O'Connell isn't it, but this team is still in the thick of a playoff hunt, then I think you're more aggressive for a quarterback. You make some calls to to some guys with starting experience. That's the only that's the only scenario in which I think Geno Smith or Sam Howell makes sense. Both of those guys have starting experience. Sam Howell started every game for the Washington Commanders last year. Um, but the Seattle Seahawks may see Sam Howell as their future because they they acquired him from the Commanders for a reason and gave up a third rounder to get him. So I think Geno Smith, if he's not the guy, will be more available. But you only go after Geno Smith if you feel like he can help you get to the playoffs. If not, then you just ride it out with what you got or you look somewhere else at a different quarterback. Head and Hooker, you mentioned it. Uh, He's been a favorite of Raider Nation to, to pick up as acquisition to see what he's got. 
I think the Lions are going to hold on tight. To, for Even though they gave Jared Goff an extension, I think the Lions are going to hold on tight to Hendon Hooker because, you know, after Jared Goff, he may be the next man up. Absolutely. Thanks for the call, Jacob. We did have a couple more calls. We will get to your calls on Thursday. So if you didn't make it on this show, we apologize for that, but we're up against time here. Mo, let everybody know what you got going this week on not only Bleacher Report, but also on Sports Not. So I have a Bleacher Report piece coming up on players who already look like steals at training camp. And there is a Raider that made the list. And I'm sure a lot mm. of you know who that might be. <laughs> Day three pick who's looking good, as I said, is the star of camp in my in our last show, Silver so Black today. So look out for that. I'll also be on after the Minnesota Vikings Raiders preseason game Saturday night. It's a late, late night uh, finish for us on the East Coast. But going to tough it up for Raider Nation. We're going to have a Bleacher Report live right after the Minnesota Vikings Raiders game. Join in for that. Also, tune in to Scott over here at Silver Black today. I'm sure he'll be on with Murph as well. So some dual action for Raider fans who want to split the time difference between Scott and I and Murph. Uh, it's going to be a lot to talk about. So the first game yes. decided to have it decided to have a post game reaction for it. Some some football to talk about. It's going to be very nice. Uh, we certainly appreciate you guys being with us, Mo, my friend. Take care. I'll see you for Thursday's show. Take care. See you soon. Yes, and for our producer Mike Robbie. I'm Scott Branson and Mo Moten. We're here all the time for you. You'll see a bunch of shows coming up here very soon. We'll have a guest on Thursday. We'll tell you what the who that is on Wednesday, just to tease you a little bit. Uh, but we certainly appreciate you subscribing wherever you get the podcast, wherever you get your audio, I should say, is where you can find our podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for being part of the show and being active there in the comments. Always fun. And then also uh, want to just give a shout out to everybody out there who sends us notes, talks with us. We appreciate it very much. It's all good stuff. And we will see you again on Thursday. Take care, everyone.